This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Greg, I'd like to actually start with you. Maybe you can paint a picture for us about what it was like being a ranger out on Kakadu National Park and seeing it all go pear-shaped. Well, there's, there's two answers to that, really. One, one answer is that uh, I have to confess that I spent 30 years being paid to have fun. Um, Kakadu is a phenomenal place, and um, even though many of you may have been there, you only get to see the very surface of it. What lies beneath the skin of Kakadu is so much better than what you see as a tourist. But having said that, yes, I arrived there to work in 1979, and wildlife was everywhere. It was almost a problem. We had it in our... Animals were chewing out the motorbike seats. We had animals chewing out the back of the fridges. We had birds um, taking our food from the table, if you weren't careful. Um, and, of course, in those days, there were plenty of buffalo as well and things like that. But it's a very strange thing, and scientists are greatly puzzled by the fact that in the last decade, more importantly, in the last five years, there's been a catastrophic collapse in the wildlife in Kakadu. Not just mammals, but birds, reptiles, the whole lot seem to be plunging into oblivion, and we don't really know why. And this is one of Australia's greatest national parks with a, a mammoth budget, ranges everywhere, and it's not good. So you're, you're running a national park, and you say you don't know why the animals are disappearing. Surely you must have some idea. I mean, you know, are people stealing them? What's, what's oh, going no. on? It's not that. Smuggling is, is unimportant completely unimportant. It's all environmental factors uh, and there's a whole lot of things which interrelate with one another. There's change fire regimes. Uh, oddly the removal of buffalo is an interesting one. There were 60,000 head of buffalo at any one time in Kakadu. Since they've gone the landscape's changed. Fire has changed. There's all sorts of new and emerging threats particularly and, and this might sound paradoxical but one of the biggest threats facing wildlife in North Australia are grasses, African grasses. They're almost impossible to identify when they're small. By the time they get large enough to identify, they're throwing seeds all over the landscape and they burn at several times the heat and intensity of the native fires or the traditional fires. So the, those issues, um, weeds is a big one. Uh, there's also feral cats, um, pigs, those sorts of things. And the fact that rangers themselves tend to be constrained in their activities because of bureaucratic processes and complying with occupational health and safety and all sorts of things which kind of hedge in the activities of rangers to some degree. So they're doing a great job. They're good people, both the traditional owners and the, the white rangers who've been there, many of them for many years. But it's a Goliath and David situation. They're fighting a losing battle in many ways. They just, although I should say quickly that the rangers have had a couple of excellent successes with a shocking weed from, uh, I think, South America called Mimosa pigra, a big shrubby woody weed with spikes. And also, I think the only animal ever to be totally eradicated from any given landscape was done in Kakadu, uh, and it was an ant, um, a big-headed ant from Africa, which was in the town of Jabiru and in some of the other uh, communities within the park. And that's been totally eradicated. So there are some good stories, but overshadowing that, the fight is almost unwinnable over time. Mike, you are a paleontologist. In fact, you were my supervisor all those years ago back in the, the Pleistocene, I think and it I'm was. I'm sorry, I want to apologise <laughs> now. You, you can apologise to the whole of Australia if you wish. <laughs> um, but one thing that's developed in paleontology, uh, particularly over the last 20 years or so, is an appreciation of, of extinction. Extinction is actually a positive force in the evolutionary history of the planet Earth. So. Do you have mixed feelings about the extinction that you're watching? Oh, God, do I have mixed feelings about it. As a paleontologist, as you say, you, we both watched and wallowed in all the wonderful creatures that have come and gone in the history of Australia and the rest of the world. And that's fine, of course, as long as the ones that go are replaced by other ones that fill in the gap. So biodiversity maintains a kind of an even stability. The problem that we're seeing now is that that's exactly what's not happening. The, we've had an ethic in Australia, I think, for too long about preservation. Somehow we, we imagine the world is going to stay exactly the way we found it. And, in, and somehow it's our job as faunal managers, as biologists, to figure out what is it that we've got to do to keep things exactly the way they are. And this is absurd. I mean, this is kind of like three-dimensional approach to conservation. And it's not conservation, it's preservation. So I think what we're saying is that understanding that extinction is a natural part of the process, 
Um, without it, animals and plants that are not particularly well adapted to a changing world would just stay there and the whole thing would collapse. So you've got to get the ones that are not fit basically to move over and let evolution replace them with ones that are fit. But the trick is, how do you maintain ecosystems in a way that ensures that real conservation, i.e. replacement of extinction with new species can occur? And yes, we're paleontologists, and I've often been told, get back to your bones and stop worrying about conservation. You're, you're on that side of the fence, all the things that are dead. But actually, they've got messages for us. They tell us, in many ways, what's required to secure the things into the future. And I find more and more we're using the fossil record not just to produce horrors and weird toothy things that scare the life out of kids, but you know, what is it we need to learn from this to, to make sure that we're conserving the fauna into the future? I, I've gone into a bit like one of my other PhD students, Tim Flannery, I've gone into a kind of a depressed period where I think this is not working and, and a bit like Greg is saying, you know, we know we're losing things at a furious rate. We've lost 18 mammals in the last 200 years. But there are ways to turn this around. And as paleontologists were saying, well, how much land do we need to have in conservation capable form before we can say, we put this system together in a way that evolution will replace the things that we've lost. And this is, I think, why we're all here, mm -hmm. is looking for these innovative strategies that will do what conventional preservation type activities have so far failed to do. What else can we do that will augment the very valuable, important current strategies and give our biota and us and our kids a future? When it comes to novel strategies, Keith, you've spent the last 25 years or so in Africa mm -hmm. um, pioneering the idea that one great way to save an ecosystem is to selectively shoot it. Uh, can you tell us what you've been up to with, uh, with elephants and lions and, and how, it's, uh, while it might seem contradictory to mm. conserve species by allowing them to be shot, how that's worked out? The interesting thing is I, I, I'd love to admit that I started all, but I didn't. It was started in 1975 by, in Zimbabwe under a thing called the Windfall Program, which was uh, run by a chap by the name of Rowan Martin and a professor called Marshall Murphy, who came up with a, a way of looking at wildlife to protect it outside of national parks. Now what we're talking about is in the communal areas of Africa. And what we look at this and we say, all right, this, most of the ranges of large mammals is outside of national parks. Mammals don't stop at the borders of national parks. So they're ranging outside of the borders of the national parks. And we take elephants, which is mostly what my studies have been about. Elephants have a, their range is 60% outside of national parks. And the group I actually studied longest was in Namibia and their range was 97% outside of national parks. So they're living inside the communal areas. This is where people live. Now, if we want these animals to live on and, and prosper, as it were, and therefore we can have these community-based natural resource management programs, as well, they, they've been modernly termed, what do we need to support these animals? And it's not just the, I mean, we, look, we pick up the, what we call the, uh, the charismatic species. We talk about lions and we talk about elephants and we talk about giraffe, and because you know them and you can readily associate with them. Their, their history is well run, they're well documented and ev just about every national park program you'll get lions, elephants and giraffe, just as an example. You may not get hyenas and you may not get the small mammals that are associated with that, but you get the charismatic megathorma. So if you're looking at the charismatic megathorma, how best is preserved this outside of a national park? Okay, inside of a national park, it's a completely different argument and it's not for what this debate is about. But outside of a national park, we talk about sustainable use. So if you're looking at somewhere like Northwest Namibia, when I started Northwestern Namibia, which is 1997, seems a long time ago now, but uh, what we did, there was only about a 423 elephants outside of the Itosha in Northwest Namibia. Myself, working with a number, number of other NGOs, it wasn't just me, but we now got a population of over 850 elephants in northwest Namibia. Populations of elephants are very interesting. If you read the national media and listen to all the conservation programs, you'd believe that elephants are in danger. There are 625,000 elephants in Africa. They do not suit the biological criteria of an endangered, threatened, nor even vulnerable species. The thing is, they're a, they're a flagship species, what we call a flagship species. So everybody can associate elephants with conservation. 
So when you talk about, all right, how best to conserve these animals outside of their natural, outside of protected areas, and outside of their national parks, we talk about a thing called giving the community-based natural resource management program, which gives the, the right of management back to the local communities. And it works. And how it works is you put a price on that animal. So the animal, and to shoot an elephant in Africa in most areas will cost you 50,000 US dollars. These animals, through a professional hunting organization. The quotas are set by government. So then there's never been a decline in a wildlife species when you have managed professional hunting, which is quota set by government, undertaken by professional hunters. If we talk about a thing I like to call citizen hunting, where the local people start to shoot animals, then you can talk population declines because people are unregulated. If they don't want an animal in an area, they will shoot it out. Trust me, they will, it will cease to exist. I've seen it in three different areas where people don't want the animals in an area, they'll shoot it out. So what happens is now we have to come up as conservationists is how best to maintain that species in an area and how best to benefit the local communities who live in close association with it. And while I would not like to get into the morals of the debate of whether it's better to shoot an elephant or not, $50,000 is an incredible amount of money to an African community. And that, from that, the government takes $10,000, the local community takes $10,000, and the hunter takes the rest. But that money goes directly to the local community. And you've got association with that, less cost than you do with something like photographic safaris in terms of environmental cost. If you look at an area of land, say we set aside 100,000 kilometres of area, just in a big area of land, how much does it actually cost to manage that land? Now, if you had community-based safaris and professional hunting, normally you have one operator who uses skinners, six sets of skinners, uh, he has a, a facility, and then he has uh, very few other things. To, and he uses, he doesn't want anybody else in the area because he's hunting. So you have a very low environmental impact on the land. If you have photographic safaris, what you have is you have up to 50 people in the same area who want to, to earn the same amount of money. And then you, what you have, you have to support them. So you have large lodges, you have lots of people employed, you do, but then you have accumulated waste from those people. And what do you do as a photographic safari? You want to go and see the land. You want to go and see wildlife. So you're touring around that land constantly, looking and disturbing wildlife. So if you're actually talking about what is beneficial for the animals and the land, then hunting is, simply because it has less environmental impact on the land itself and it returns a large revenue resource. And we're not talking endangered. We are talking threatened, but we're not talking endangered species. They're locally abundant in these areas. So it makes very good sense. Plus, it keeps the local communities from shooting the animals. And isn't it the case, Keith, that because of this, there's now more of Africa's wildlife in these game reserves than there is in all the national parks put together? That is correct. And, and depending on the, because the animals' ranges are so large, now the, large, the number of animals you can support on any piece of land, any piece of land, is directly proportional to the area available. So if you only have 100,000 hectares of land, you can, because of the biomass available for the animals to eat, you can only support that number of animals. Now, if you increase that to half a million hectares, then you can increase uh, proportionally the animals to that area of land. It's a direct linear relationship. And I actually want to tease that out as a model for conservation uh, a little later mm. because uh, I'd like to introduce Rosie here. Uh, you've completed this report on keeping native animals as pets as another strategy of being able to preserve uh, some of the species that are going extinct. Tell me a bit about this report. What did, what did you actually find? Is it a viable option? Well, the report was a feasibility study carried out with um, a number of co-authors, including Rosalie Chappell, who's here in the audience. And we were basically asked by the Rural Industries R&D Corps in Australia to ask whether it was feasible to set up an industry based on the keeping of native mammals as pets in a way that would actually enhance conservation objectives. And it's not a simple answer at all, and very much the devil's in the detail. It depends what species you, you're talking about and very much how it's done. But we found that certainly there are some species which are very well suited for keeping as pets. Um, for instance, a quoll, Mike Archer has had long experience of keeping native animals and has kept <laughs> quolls <laughs> and has written about it extensively. 
Uh, we found quolls with some caveats would be very suitable for at least experienced keepers to keep in their yards. And we asked the question, why is it that we're keeping these exotic, introduced, dangerous predators, dogs and cats as pets, which readily go feral and pose serious threats to our native wildlife, when we keep, could be keeping our own indigenous wildlife? So we looked at a range of potential negative consequences, and there are potential problems, depending how it's done. But we also looked at a range of potential conservation benefits. And there's a number of them. But one of the ones that I think is potentially the most important is really reconnecting people with wildlife. There are about 100 native mammals on our current federal endangered species list. Can anybody in the room name more than, say, two or three of them? <laughs> okay, that's one out of this whole audience. We don't know our native mammals. You know, our children grow up learning about giraffes and lions and rhinos and hippos and dogs and cats and pigs, but they don't know about bilbies and potteroos and gliders and, the, and cuscusses and all sorts of our Australian native mammals. So I think there are kind of two visions of conservation competing at the moment. And one is what I see as a very urban vision in which we all sort of sit here in our urban environment and nature is out there behind fences and it's protected and it's okay because we don't touch it. And the other is actually not really a new but a more traditional vision of conservation where we're out there, we're in the landscape, we're using wildlife and through that we're learning about it and we're respecting it and we value it because we use it. Um, I've worked primarily on wildlife trade primarily based in the UK for international conservation organizations like WWF and IUCN. And all around the world, there are successful conservation projects based on people using wildlife. And through using wildlife, they value it in certain circumstances. Now, talking about use is very complex because using wildlife can also be what drives wildlife to extinction. So think of the dodo or the passenger pigeon or the stellar sea cow, or all sorts of animals that were very valuable and they were used, southern bluefin tuna, you know, but were driven to very low levels or made completely extinct. But in other situations like the elephants, people are using wild wildlife and through that conserving them. So it's not a straightforward equation and this is why I think the debate is so complex because use can drive conservation in certain circumstances. In other circumstances, it can lead to extinction. So when you start talking about use, people think of all those bad examples and say, that's an absolutely shocking, terrible idea. We shouldn't commodify wildlife. We need to leave it out safe in the bush where it's safe. And there's two problems with that. One is that wildlife is not safe in the bush in the, anymore. And the other is that you do have these situations, and there are many of them around the world now, where use has really driven very positive wildlife um, success and regeneration stories. I, uh, when you mentioned putting a value on wildlife, uh, a stat that blew me away when I found out only earlier this year is back in the days of whaling, in modern terms, mm. each sperm whale was worth $10 million. Wow. That's how much you could actually get, uh, gain out of killing a, a sperm whale. And it was just this lump of blubber sitting there waiting to be harpooned. It was yeah. easy stuff. So, you know, the when you talk about putting a value on wildlife, mm. um, uh, there's a, a whole debate there. But something that, that, that I'm curious about with the idea of keeping native pets, you mentioned that you know, there's 100 endangered mammals uh, or vertebrates in, in Australia. So threatened, not strictly endangered. Threatened, yeah. OK. Um, most of those are rats and mice. Like a quarter of Australia's native species are rodents, another quarter are bats. Um, and they don't actually seem to be that appealing to be kept as pets by me. Is that a problem with this approach? Is, I want your PhD back, back mate. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on crocodiles, remember? Yeah, They're unprocessed yeah. crocodile shit as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> edit. Um, but, but just the principle of the idea of... of keeping pets or, or, or saving species by, by keeping them as pets works when the animal is charismatic and suitable to be a pet, but there's surely a lot of species out there that aren't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I don't think you can judge what's charismatic to, 
from your own preferences to other people. Like there's a big um, native reptile pet keepers world out there. I don't see any particular appeal of keeping reptiles, but a lot of people would take a great deal of issue with the idea that they were uncharismatic species. So, but, but more broadly, no, it's not the answer to everything. It's not a silver bullet. It's not what's going to save conservation. But it could be a good idea, and it could help. And it's not something that would cost a lot of government money. We're talking about a regulated private industry. So the money which would be coming in to fund captive breeding of these animals in sort of well-regulated, conservation-focused institutions would be private money. That's what we need. Conservation desperately needs private money. You know, government budgets for conservation are being cut all over the country. We're, we're not putting more money into this as our lists of threatened species grow as they do virtually every year. We're putting less and less money in. So we need new ways, not to displace the current ways, but to augment them. This isn't, you know, the idea of sustainable use or keeping pets, this is not any kind of criticism of protected areas. You know, they're really important. But it's saying, what else can we do? How can we bring more power and force to conservation? How can we enlist the enormous resources of the public and the private sector in a way which isn't just spreading more dogs and cats around the country, but actually potentially setting up reservoir populations of the, some of the species that could really need it in the future? But what Rosie says is so vital because what all of us are trying to push here are all compatible strategies. There isn't, as you say, one silver bullet here. There are probably an infinite number of bullets, a terrible analogy actually, <laughs> um, silver hands. I mean, there's many different strategies that have been demonstrated to have conservation value all over the world. We need to be smart, look at all of those, the ones that work, the ones that don't. And I think, and the big challenge is to figure out how can we trial some of these here, given the bureaucratic constraints that we often have that don't enable us to even attempt to do these things, such as keeping native animals as pets. This is so severely regulated at the moment that um, it's only people, a few people like myself and who have actually had these experiences who know how wonderful they can be and how effective native animals as pets can be as emissaries to engage the next generation of Australians in, in valuing and wanting to make sure that our biota is conserved, they have to make contact with these things. But we are in a situation at the moment, apart from Rosie and, and Rosalie's wonderful study, which at least says we should think about trialing these things, there aren't too many opportunities to explore this, other than I would imagine individuals who are even doing it illegally, you, know, you can be thrown in jail for keeping sugar gliders in some areas of Australia, and yet in the U.S., um, we know one breeder, I put a student onto exploring the experiences of people keeping sugar gliders in the United States, our animals, and they found one breeder that's selling 20,000 sugar gliders a year to Americans, they call them pocket pets, and overwhelmingly the experience of people who have them is that they're wonderful companions. So, and we can't do this yet. We, we do need to, to pay attention to what Rosalie's found in that study, and somehow that's got to translate to governments giving us an opportunity to trial these things. I here. was somewhat shocked to find that regulation's gone so far now that uh, that thing that all kids did at my age of collecting a few tadpoles out of the local creek and watching them metamorphose mm -hmm. into frogs, you're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> That, that, that is against is, the law. Is that actually true? Well, that's, there, that, there that's a, what I was told when I tried to do it a couple of years ago as a yeah. demonstration. There is FATS, so, the Frog and Tadpole Society. Yeah. <laughs> I think they have some kind of maybe permits, but you have yeah. to go through a lot of rigmarole. You're keeping to a get couple this. of blue tongue lizards yes. for a couple of yeah. weeks. Mm. Yeah. That now is, mm. is, is a no no. Mm. Um, uh, but, but speaking, Rosie, you touched on you can't see why anybody would want to keep reptiles. Greg, that's exactly what you do. Um, <laughs> and uh, I gather that, that one of the problems uh, with reptiles in particular uh, uh, and uh, people keeping them is hybridizing them, people mixing species up uh, left, right, and center. I think there's one quote from you was that. Uh, one breeder seemed intent on trying to produce a python that looks like a barber's pole. Um, how big a problem is hybridization? Um, well, this is a, a, quite an interesting element, and I should say that I don't breed barber's poles. Um, <laughs> I breed pig-nosed turtles, which are pretty special in their own right. Bum breeders. <coughs> That's true. Mm, they're not famous for that. Oh, okay. Other turtles are. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is because having lived and worked in Kakadu for 
30 odd years and raising a family there, we were able to keep almost any native animal we chose which lives in the Kakadu environment. So my children had enormous experience with all sorts of wonderful animals and, and I guess that's why I'm here because it seems unfair almost that you know, rangers are allowed to have the, the, the joy of having fasca gales and, and black-footed tree rats, rodents, which are fantastic animals, uh, but none of you can. Um, what a shame. You're missing out on something fantastic. But they can have, ro they can have mice, which is ridiculous, and introduce rodent but not the more wonderful Australian rodents. But as for barber po poles, <laughs> it is true that, that there are a whole lot of reptile people who try to breed all sorts of wonderful, bizarre colours and shapes and whatever, uh, pythons in particular. They're called morphs. Um, but very often, these same keepers will also have their pure strain in the same collection, but quarantined. So what happens in some cases is they actually breed these incredibly looking things. They are quite stunning. Some are brick red and brilliant yellows and golds. They can sell those for quite large sums of money, and that money is turned back to help maintain their collection, which in turn helps the collection of their pure strain olive pythons or, or water pythons, whatever it might, might be. They don't necessarily interchange. You can have this parallel mindset. And really, the morphing system and, and hybridizing, although not much hybridizing happens, it's morphing within a species generally. Um, is, is a parallel issue and it's really not that significant in the overall scheme of things. It's uh, interesting you say that they produce a variety of colours and, and uh, shapes. I can understand a variety of colours in pythons, but surely they're all the one shape, aren't they? Sort of yeah, pretty much. That, one in that wasn't a very well chosen word, <laughs> but, but I will say you can get scaleless death adders now. Oh, no. Really? Yeah, I know you want one. <laughs> no, actually, uh, that's probably very low on my list of priorities. Uh, what's the point of breeding a scaleless death adder? Well, you'd have to see, uh, see one to understand. Uh, I, personally, I don't understand it either. I love death adders. I think they're fantastic. Pets? I don't know if you'd call a death adder a pet. But when you, you wouldn't see want to stroke it. When, when you see a scaleless one, they look like geckos without legs. They're really, really odd. Actually, you can, you can interchange experimentally scales and feathers in chickens. You suppose you get feathers on the death adder? Uh, it's possible. No, let's not go there. <laughs> Mike, you have actually, uh, you're famous for having had a pet crawl. What's it like having a, a uh, pet crawl? I'm, it, it was a while ago, uh, but it is so much a core part of me, is the experience. It was just an accidental experience. I was studying carnivorous marsupials uh, for my PhD when I was in WA, and somebody knew I had an interest in this. And a person asked me, because they had a colony of these associated with a hospital, would I like to raise a, um, a western quoll? And I actually, I'm studying their skulls. I'm studying the teeth of all these carnivorous marsupials, but I never actually held a live one before. And suddenly, in my hands was this beautiful thing, about the size of a kitten, uh, covered in white spots, and just looking at me like, you know, what kind of a quoll are you? Now, I spent the next 12 months falling in total love with this animal. Um, it was cleaner than any cat you've ever imagined, obsessive user of a kitty litter box, playful throughout its life. I mean, I had it for five years until it bit a cane toad in Brisbane and introduced cane toad and died in 20 minutes in my arm in tetanic contractions. I was destroyed for weeks after that. But in that period of time, several things happened. One, this mutual love affair, this real bond that's as strong as anything you'd get with any dog or, or cat, probably even stronger than with the average kid, I would say. <laughs> it was really powerful. And, but what came along the same, at the same time was an understanding about what was considered to be a mysterious, poorly known, uh, endangered Australian animal in Western Australia that nobody knew anything about. And I'm living with this animal and finding out things that I cannot discuss on the ABC. Go on. Uh, I'd love to, but I don't think I'd better. <laughs> Suffice it to say, these are animals of mystery with extraordinarily interesting aspects to their life that we had no idea about. And I think the reptile keepers have made the same point. Alan Greer said this some time ago, that something like a third of our knowledge about the biology of Australian reptiles comes from people who have kept them as pets. Things that we hadn't learned in all the time people had spent out in the bush trying to study them, that knowledge, which was important for conservation, was coming through people who kept these animals as pets. This is another reason why we need this program to expand. It's interesting you talk about the experience of having studied the fossils of these guys and then meeting a real one in the flesh, how, how it changed your perception as, you know, like... What would it have done you for you well, with I the crocodile? Well, I spent years studying the fossil <laughs> crocodiles and 
my first introduction to a real one was when on Catalyst when I had to sit on a four and a half metre crocodile for half an hour while someone attached a satellite transmitter. <laughs> Um, it was a different experience. Uh, it was moments like that that you find out that adrenaline is brown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Keith, Amen. moving the conversation along, the experience you had of wildlife management in South Africa or Southern Africa, hmm. translate that to Australia. Is that possible? No. Why not? Fair. What we do here is we have... <laughs> There are no commercially, I mean, I'll change, we know how we, we cull kangaroos, but they're individually, they're a very small price per individual. Most of the hunting done in this country is done on ferals. So they're hunting goats, pigs, uh, foxes, and rabbits, as most of the hunters are doing. So the experience of Africa is not really translatable. Well, we have a high-priced game that you can actually hunt. So it comes back to what you're saying, we need different scenarios. Now, it's interesting, if, just as an aside, we go back to the species, that, you're going to love this, that aren't really, really as sociable as, as crocodiles. Now, in 1973 in Africa, in southern Africa, the crocodile nilus, the southern African crocodile, was hunted to the point of extinction. And there were very few of them then. A bloke by the name of John Hutton in Zimbabwe, what he did, is he looked at it and said, right, why don't we take the eggs from the remaining nests in the field, rear them, in the, in the captive situation, release 2% a year at two years of age back into the wild. And then the rest we can keep in the crop farms and harvest the product thereof. Because that's why they went extinct, was the fact that people were harvesting them in the wild and not leaving enough for regeneration. So John came up with this idea, they implemented it, and now crocodiles are more plentiful in Southern Africa than they are anywhere else in the world. They're, they're very very plentiful animal and we are again harvesting and the law still in place where you must release two percent of the animals at two years of age. Isn't that applicable to Australia? Yes. Absolutely, right. sorry, um, yeah, that was, yes. The Northern Territory applied for the right to uh, allow safari hunting of large crocodiles to mm. the federal government because this species is, uh, well the import export to and from the country is governed by the federal government. The federal Minister of the Environment said no to the Northern Territory's proposal despite uh, an overwhelming amount of evidence to say this should happen. Mm. One of the benefits um, for doing it, of course, was to provide employment uh, opportunities and income for Aboriginal people, mm. who in many cases around the north coast of Australia have very little opportunity to derive any financial benefit from their land, unless they happen to have a uranium mine or something like that, which is not everywhere. Um, so crocodiles was one opportunity to develop a viable safari industry. Mm. And all the indicators said, yes, this is a good thing to do for a whole range of reasons, not the least of which, of course, being that crocodiles are now so numerous in the Northern Territory, more than 70,000, similar story to yours in Africa, mm. uh, that they're killing livestock all around the place and okay. they're killing and attacking People. men, women and children. Mm. And still the federal government said, no, we will not allow any trophy crocodiles to leave this country. And that was the end of it. And it's an extraordinary case because these are animals that are shot as problem animals. There's an offtake that can, of live animals that can be taken from the wild under a legal quota. There's about 70,000. And the quota that the Northern Territory has now asked for several times is about 25. So 25 animals out of a population of over 70,000 you know, it's biologically completely meaningless. So the objection of the federal government was based purely on, I think, it appears, no reason has ever been given for their rejection of the idea, but it seems to be based purely on the fact that they're concerned about annoying, kind of quite vocal animal rights-based opposition groups who are very, very effective at jumping up and down and kind of agitating public opinion on what should be a kind of you know, carefully reasoned, science-based decision. Uh, Greg, your experience is up at, at Kakadu. You, you, you're saying that it could work with the crocs if the permission was there. Are there other species that could be managed to yeah, same Yeah, well, way? crocodiles, oddly, because they're so common, are not, needing, are not really in need of direct conservation intervention. Uh, my thinking is that we have a whole range of threatened species which make good pets. They're charming, charismatic animals which are disappearing. So there's a whole range of threatened species which the government has taken the view, and this is all the state governments are the same, that because it's rare, we'd better lock it up and watch it become extinct. You know, this seems to be the way governments work. I don't know why it is. I really can't get my head around it. Why the government agencies which are responsible for the protection of our fauna 
actually oversee its extinction in many cases. And Kakadu is a classic example, but what, two things I didn't mention in the earlier preamble uh, was cane toads, which of course is an immense problem in North Australia, not just in Kakadu. And also the problems of Afri African grasses and things like this are not only within Kakadu, but they're right across the top end. But in cane toads in particular are like this, this tidal wave of death moving from Queensland across North Australia towards Western Australia. And now in the Kimberley, which was one of the most fantastic paradises for Australian wildlife that you could get on the Australian continent. And as this cane toad front swarms through the Kimberley, it's killing native animals in their thousands as we speak. Goannas, snakes, uh, marsupials, particularly carnivorous marsupials, of course, a range of bird species, all sorts of creatures are just falling over dead in their tens of thousands. And yet, if you were to go into the Kimberley and, and collect a pair of Merton's water monitors or something like that, to captive breed to try and save the Kimberley species, you'd be arrested for doing it. And yet they're dying in their thousands. Where's the sense in that? OK, well, we're just about time for questions. But before we do, uh, I'll question again for Keith and, and, and Greg in particular, is the, the rise of the private wildlife sanctuaries. Uh, as, a, as opposed to public uh, and government-owned uh, parks and reserves. Does that actually make conservation sense when there are privately funded groups out there trying to conserve areas? Is that a sensible strategy? Keith? Yes, in, in theoretically, yes. But uh, in, in the African situation, and, and yes, they, they fulfil a short-term goal. But primarily in Africa, if you go to a game park, they're interested in showing you the big five. As a tourist, they're set up as tourism lodges, so they're interested in the big five, which is rhino, elephant, lion, hippo, and buffalo, or leopard and buffalo, depending on where you are. So that's what you want to see if you go to a game park in Africa. So that's what the management strategies are all about, are a bit the big five. And if you wanted to see hyena, forget it, because in, in some areas, because and then the predators, because they eat the the species that are what most people want to see. So they keep them in balance. And the management, as I said, the management strategies are about the big five. So short term, yes. Overall, we have to address the national parks issues. And national parks are for biodiversity, whereas private game reserves tend not to be for biodiversity. They tend to be for selected species that tourists want to see. Having said that, yes, there is a role for them. Personally, I'd much rather go to a national park and see national parks jacked up to the point where they can protect our native species. But it, there is a role for them because they can offer that to the tourism market and that's what the tourist wants to see. They don't want to spend five days trekking through a wilderness and not see the big five. They want to see it in an afternoon so they can get on the jet next morning and jet out to the next park. In the Australian context, you have a situation where private wildlife parks and, and enthusiastic amateurs can play an immensely important role in uh, maintaining what are sometimes called insurance collections of animals, which are at, at risk in the wild. And a very good example of this is happening here in New South Wales. Uh, the Australian Reptile Park, a guy called John Weigel, who's been there many years, was able to get approval from Western Australia to collect some rough scaled pythons from the Kimberley, this area I was mentioning earlier, a species which may well be vulnerable to the cane toad when it gets there. And after, I think, five years of lobbying, he was finally allowed to take 10 rough scale pythons, which is the second rarest python species in Australia, or one of the two rarest python species in Australia, from the Kimberley to Gosford, uh, where he's been able to breed them so successfully and then sell them into the, into the amateur market, to the point now where they're, they're only worth 1,000, uh, they're about $1,600 each, I think somebody could probably tell me. There are about 1,000 young snakes on the market in, in Australia today as a result of his breedings. Meanwhile, back in the Kimberleys, we've no idea what's going to happen to that snake, but there is this insurance collection still existing and still available for reintroductions if ever the time came when cane toads could be controlled. On the other hand, in Kakadu, which is a conservation reserve, as you know, there's an, this, the other very rare python is called the Owen Pelly python. Um, it was only discovered in the 1970s. It's Australia's second largest snake. It's a magnificent thing, a gentle giant, around four metres long and quiet. Um, it seems becoming very rare in Kakadu. There's only one specimen in captivity in Australia, at, in Northern Territory Wildlife Park, a government-run agency. There's a desperate need to get Owen Pelly pythons out of Kakadu. As I said earlier, there are animals just falling off the limbs, falling off, off their perches all around Kakadu. 
birds, mammals, reptiles, you name it, the Owen Pally python would appear to be at risk of, of extinction. Certainly the Northern Territory Government has listed it as a, as a vulnerable species, and yet uh, an expert python breeder and academic in Darwin who has an excellent record in doing this sort of thing has been trying unsuccessfully for eight years to get Owen Pally pythons out of Kakadu to breed in a similar manner to the rough scale pythons. But no matter what he does or how he tries, including releasing young animals back into the place where the originals come from, um, and also paying a substantial upfront money to the traditional owners of the land, plus a very significant royalty for each young one sold. But the government, the bureaucrats in the park, will still put every kind of obstacle before him to prevent this from happening. It would appear that they would much rather see this animal go extinct than for it to allow it to get out into private hands and persist and be at some time in the future available for reintroductions if it does become extinct in the wild. And I just can't get my head around that. Maybe well, well, there was one point I wanted to make uh, that, that ha we haven't touched on one big area here, and it's really more in the direction of, that Keith's been talking about, of the, the conservation values of sustainable harvest within the African mm -hmm. environment. Uh, while those game reserves may be focused on the big five, inevitably, if you went through with a microscope, you're going to find thousands of species that are surviving because those areas are working and valued to produce these, these target species. And in Australia, we have a kangaroo industry here, which has been going for nearly 40 years sustainably without any impact on kangaroo numbers. Their numbers fluctuate because of climatic changes and droughts and so on, not because of the harvesting industry. And the magic here that can happen is if, to whatever extent, the and Rosie has, has actually developed models for how this could work, to whatever extent the, the grazers out there could turn from thinking about kangaroos as pests to a sustainably harvestable resource that they can get some value out of, they will stop feeling any incentive to clear native vegetation because they don't value it, they don't get anything out of it, it's not producing cattle and sheep for them. If they can get some value out of sustainable harvest of kangaroos, they're going to be desperately anxious to maintain the native vegetation and all these other endangered species, the other hundred species we're concerned about, are going to get a chance, even though they're not charismatic, to go back to your original point. You can get the ugliest spider in the world is going to luck out because somebody wants to have a kangaroo steak. And I think that's really important that sustainable harvest can actually be a huge leg up in Australia to augmenting conservation for a whole range of species most people don't even know are out there. All right, let's open this up to questions from the floor. <laughs> My question is to all the panelists. Um, you've talked a lot about different things that have worked in other places, and you've talked a bit about bureaucratic lethargy that you encounter here. Um, to go just from an inspiring talk to something that actually happens in the real world, what type of things would you have to do to make sure that these things enable the average person maybe watching at home or in the audience now to be able to have a qual at home? Because you brought up a number of issues that have stopped that from happening previously. Anyone? Well, the easiest thing to do is move to the Northern Territory or South Australia. Yeah where any animal can be kept by anybody with the right uh, specialized knowledge. In the Northern Territory, there are no knowledge requirements. In South Australia, you may need to have kept certain other species first. But if that doesn't suit you, it gets more complicated. The, uh, to add to that, there, there is a book um, by Steve, oh, what's his surname? The, on the husbandry of Australian mammals. It's oh, often Steve been said. Jackson. Jackson, sorry, Steve Jackson, what a wonderful man. I mean, one of the reasons he wrote that book was to, frankly, demonstrate to the people who said, we don't know enough about native animals to justify being able to keep them because they'll all drop dead when we're trying to look after them. And he published a book about husbandry of native mammals. There's a huge amount of information out there uh, growing every single day. So that all we want, I think all of us, all those of us who are interested in seeing these kinds of strategies um, begin to expand is the opportunity to conduct trials. It's not, we don't want to see legislation suddenly changed or anybody can have anything they want. That would be crazy and it would go back to situations that could quite likely lead, lead to extinction of species. We want managed trials where you would have a breeding facility um, that was approved and sanctioned and managed um, by government, monitored, and that from those breeding sanctuaries you could have, you could get individuals that would not be cheap. I mean, people are ready to pay $1,000 for a fancy puppy with a weird looking distorted face or whatever. Um, why can't you do the same thing with a marsupial? And then monitor how it goes. I think trials will get us through a lot of these um, 
what if kinds of uh, precautionary reasons that people don't want to go down these paths. They think, what if we get a fatal disease from some marsupial? What fatal disease? We give them fatal diseases. Cats give them fatal diseases. Trials will get us over a lot of that problem. And I think the answer to your question is, we just want to be able to run some carefully ma managed community projects or trials um, to s demonstrate whether it does or it doesn't work. There's a sense of urgency with this as well, because uh, if you look at North Australia in particular, and even Central Australia, where buffalo grass is causing so much environmental damage, uh, cane toads alone are causing such a shift in the species uh, composition and densities across North Australia that the various state governments involved can barely change the classifications of species fast enough to keep up with the rising list of threatened species. So we need to do something soon, not later. And uh, I heard that when the cane toad arrived in the Northern Territory, the first thing that the government did was take it off the pest species list because if it remained there, there is an obligation for farmers to do something about it. And it was just such an insurmountable problem that the best thing to do was say, well, it's not a pest. Is That's the that problem true? we have with, with these introduced grasses, these African grasses as well, is that nobody wants to list them as an exotic species because it's too hard to do anything about it. But it, when That's the a great Australian solution, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> when Just reclassify the problem. When the cane toad first arrived in Kakadu, the, the, really the only response that the park could have to that was to monitor the effect. And so we've been monitoring the decline of animals, native animals, ever since. But it hasn't helped much. We have another question from the floor. Now, I want to ask you this question. You have been describing how to cure the symptoms, but you never actually address the cause. Mm. I believe the cause is there are too many of human people around the world. You're taking up your land masses. Absolutely. Right. Now, what are you going to do about it? I mean, do <laughs> <laughs> are, are you going to call us? I might use the famous edit at this point, but <laughs> <laughs> until they allow us to cull people, then we have to look at a situation <laughs> where we can actually look at management of animals in conjunction with living with people. I think that. And, um, I think that's the problem with yeah. population, though. Mm. Everybody thinks it's a good idea not to have so many people, but how do you do it? Yeah. Who's going to put their hand up and say they won't have any children? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, actually, maybe we've solved the problem. But, you know, a lot of the interventions to try to stop population have been really coercive mm. and, you know, really infringing on human rights. So how to actually do that mm. is complicated. I mean, of course, one of the best ways is to educate and empower women. That seems to have more effect than any other intervention because women in most countries, most of the time, don't actually want to have a lot of kids. And if they've got control of their own fertility, they won't. I would like to think that this group here are actually um, advocating some solutions. Um, they're only small, but they contribute a lot. Are you talking about keeping people as pets? No, I'm <laughs> talking, about, talking about conservation, nature conservation in Australia in particular. We're, we're putting forward ideas and concepts which have never been given much airplay before. So we're here to suggest that there are some other methods that you can use um, in addition to tra traditional methods to save animals. We are trying to develop some, some solutions here and there was a very successful program called Property Based Wildlife Management in Tasmania that ran for 14 years. It was developed on private land over one and a half million hectares and 500 properties. It managed abundant species and exotic and native species and it was closed down on the whim of the bureaucrats. And there's a common theme here. However, the main ingredient that made it work was people management. Wildlife management is primarily about people management. And how successful we are about managing people is really reflecting on how well we are at managing wildlife. So how can the panel suggest that we can implement property-based wildlife management over a greater area and how can we educate the, the bureaucrats to allow these trials that Mike's suggesting to occur? I think we're all struggling that, with that mm. question ourselves and probably mm. don't have any very clear answers for you. Public support has got to be that. Not, not many people in Australia have even heard of what we're talking about here tonight. Most people believe that we've got our national parks regime, even though it only covers 11% of the Australian land surface. We have our national parks, so animals are safe there, so what's the problem? How many people actually know that animals are no longer safe in the bush, including in our national parks? Well, many of them are. And it's getting worse. 
because right through this nation there are environmental issues which are so intractable, so expensive, that it's just unwinnable. And I'm, I'm trying not to be a doomsday here. But, <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I find is in, uh, when I give public lectures on topics like this, you really want to stay out of the doomsday dark side of things and say, well, here are, we, know, we all know we've got problems, we've got challenges, but here's a range of potential solutions we should be exploring. And I often get people come up afterwards, serious people, with very large properties. One guy actually was a cotton farmer, and he was refusing to plant cotton on his other properties because he knew what damage this was doing to the land. And he said, I need an opportunity to do something fundamentally different. What can I do? And this is very frustrating for us who know the kinds of things that should be done, and yet you can't put them down this path because at the moment they're either not legal or they're you know, there's, there's all sorts of challenges here, but there are many Australians, which absolutely delights me, many Australians on the land who know they should be doing and could be doing and would like to be doing something profoundly different with the land that they've got. So I think there's a, a sense of willingness to go down this path. Um, and, and Rosie, I know, has, has been exploring um, theoretical ways of doing this, and I know uh, George Wilson, for example, is experimenting with issues like this in Queensland with some combined properties of how they could share resources. So there are quiet experiments going on out there. And we think about the, the, the whale story, about the $10 million of whale. That knocked me out, Paul. But it's interesting. We have plants in Australia, like Baronia, in, in southwestern Western Australia, where they were in terrible trouble, um, destroying land inadvertently, following all the recommendations from CSRO, about how you should manage agricultural land, and unfortunately, they weren't good, they weren't good bits of advice, um, suddenly discovered they had baronia on their property, that lovely smelling flower that you can smell in the corner you know, in, the, in spring when people are selling flowers. And a couple of guys around um, the southwest wondered what is causing that beautiful smell. And they did some kitchen chemistry and found out there's an oil in the baronia flower which is like ambergris, the kind of stuff they used to get out of, of whales that binds scent. And just with this simple little experiment of a native species, they are now getting $10,000 a liter for barony oil harvested on their properties, and they're not raising sheep on those properties anymore, and the land is restoring itself. So all across Australia, that's what Bob Beale and I put in the book, Going Native, there are experiments that are going on. It's just they're not coordinated nationally, they're what individual, extremely bright, motivated Australians who are sick of seeing the land degrading are doing on their own. So it is happening. It's just not happening as part of a national agenda. I did some work with an Aboriginal group in the Northern Territory who wanted to collect one spider from their land because they had a research group who were interested in looking at the, I think, the properties of the toxin. They had to get three different sets of licenses for that each of which took a year or more, and they finally gave up because, you know, there could have been enormous potential for a similar sort of thing to go on, and they were stymied by the bureaucracy. But can I just make one small point? For, <laughs> oh, you know, on, it's man. very easy to criticize bureaucracy, but they're, they're in a bind too. You know, some issue related to hunting or sustainable use, if they try to do something about it, they might get 2,000 postcards on their desk the next day from the Humane Society or one of the animal rights groups. And I don't want to completely slam the animal rights groups because they do some brilliant work with things like battery chickens and that sort of thing. But when it comes to conservation, they simply they don't know what they're talking about, quite frankly. And they advocate simplistic solutions which don't contribute anything to long-term conservation. Um, I definitely agree with you that we uh, need to look at novel approaches to conservation. And I just wanted to touch on um, the point that Mike Archer made earlier about sustainable use of wildlife and that if we valued kangaroos more, that um, we could protect uh, the ecosystems around where they live. Well, a Riddick study in 2007 found that um, killing kangaroos amounted to only 70 or 80 cents per kilogram of meat. And um, most kangaroos that are shot weigh about 13 kilos or so. So it's about $10 per kangaroo. And that kangaroo industry has been going for about 40 years now. And if we can only get around $10 per kangaroo, how can we really value them in, in a way um, that can make it viable? Um, and lots of shooters are really struggling um, to make a living out of um, shooting kangaroos and they need to take on supplementary income. So I just wanted to um, 
just get um, Mike's, Mike's point about how we could value kangaroos more when the market value is so low for them. I, I, I'm going to let Rosie handle this one, but because we've just um, written a response to the paper that I suspect you've read that was produced by the Think Group in UTS, their figures were so absurd and wrong that we were weeping. Yeah, I mean, it was a question whether you laughed at the figures that were in that paper or whether you cried. They were wrong. And the reality is that um, there is far more usable meat for human consumption off a kangaroo. It's almost a factor of two times what's in that paper. And they highly overestimated the amount of usable meat you could get from a sheep mm. to compare with it. In fact, if you actually do the reality figures that are out there, that are available to anybody, if they were honest about what they'd done, you would have found that the amount of usable meat from a kangaroo is not very much less than you get from a sheep. And you can raise three kangaroos for the same amount of feed that it takes to raise a sheep. And a kangaroo uses about a third of the water that a sheep uses. That paper, I hate to say it, should belong with Ian Plymer's book, Heaven and Earth, in the nearest round circular bin you can find and put the lid on it. Hang on, hang on. You're welcome to your opinion, Whoa. but there's other people uh, who Sorry, to just to make that, make that very clear, there's hey. not a cent of money from the kangaroo industry coming to us. On the other hand, money coming from the Sherman Foundation is funding the Think thing, and the Sherman Foundation is very committed, I think very nobly, to reducing problems like battery farming and all that sort of thing, which we all agree is not a good thing. But they're also moving into this area where they don't really understand what conservation gains we get through sustainable harvest of wildlife, or can get. Um, so they're way off base on this paper, and I, I apologize for being negative about this, but the reality is that paper's terrible, and I hope it, it, you know, it's a bit of an embarrassment. We know the people who wrote it. Uh, can I just comment on... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Excuse me. Could I answer yeah. that, please? Because I am, I've, I've been involved with a group of landholders and kangaroo harvesters, professional kangaroo shooters, um, based on the local land care group out in Western Queensland. And they've been grappling with that exactly that problem you raise. And you're absolutely right to raise it. Is there room for landholders to get involved in the kangaroo industry? And I'm glad to see that you're concerned about the livelihoods of the harvesters, because, of course, so are the harvesters. They're concerned if landholders are going to get some benefit from kangaroos as well, where are their jobs going to come from? So it's a really good concern to raise. But I'm happy to say that um, based on the work that we did with those landholders and shooters, they formed a cooperative. That cooperative, they're working collaboratively between landholders and shooters. The landholders actually own a chiller box. The shooters shoot the kangaroos, the landholders buy them, and they're now selling that you know, kangaroo meat on the market. So it can work. This is now the only group in Australia which, that are doing this. So this model that we're talking about is not just a theoretical model. And the woman who's responsible for what, uh, running it was nominated for Australian Rural Woman of the Year last year. And they've also won various other awards for this kind of innovative approach. So it is possible, but it faces a lot of hurdles, both kind of urban people in the cities and also the established kangaroo industry. Let's move along to another question from the floor. I think Dan was first. I've got a suggestion, as Dan Lunny is a bureaucrat, that um, bureaucrats should be listed as a key threatening process. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the forms are available. Terry Dawson will, in, will uh, second uh, that <laughs> submission. But I've been a bureaucrat for more than 40 years. I think you've got more chance working with bureaucrats the Steve Jacksons, uh, the uh, people who licensed yes. 487 native species in New South Wales to be kept as uh, kept um, as companion animals or pets. It's only this, but in New South Wales, there's only two of them are mammals, which is the central point. So you could register that, but reckon, but thinking just that bureaucrats are the sole. Uh, dead hand on any good idea in society, I think, is a, is a dull way to treat um, a very large group of people where the range of views are about the same as they are in society. So I'm, um, as a bureaucrat, uh, I'm very pleased to support my colleagues as a bureaucrat, <laughs> and I think for a bit more sensitivity would be terrific. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you, any of you want to respond to that? Have we been a bit well, too harsh I, on I the bureaucrats? Well, I just would want to single out Dan and say, I, I mean, he's, 
to us the epitome of somebody who is in a government department and is totally sensitive to the core issues that everybody's focused on here and is trying to help everybody find a way through these complex issues. So we're mm -hmm. enormously grateful to Dan and everybody that you work with, Dan, that's trying to help. We, we do. We always label bureaucrats, but bureaucrats are subject to the will of politicians mm -hmm. and the will of people ultimately. So our politicians impose laws and stipulations on our bureaucrats which then enforce them. And it's the same throughout the world. So bureaucrats are an obvious focal point because they're the ones we go to and say, can we have these permits to do this? And they refuse us. Now why do they refuse us? They refuse us on policy. So and that policy is made by governments, not by bureaucrats, even though bureaucrats enforce the policies. And there's a the flexibility within the system that we simply don't see most of the time. But you know, we've got to go back to our politicians who generally make decisions on wildlife and wildlife related issues and they have no clue about the decisions they're actually making. They're lawyers or they're accountants. They have no biological, very little biological background or environmental background. So while, while we do, f um, this is just an aside, while we do focus on bureaucrats to enforce the decision, it ultimately must come from the politicians to actually implement change. But and the politicians are advised by their bureaucrats. True, it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22. <laughs> and, and isn't it the case that Australia is mm. a signatory to the biodiversity conservation um, legislation? Mm. Um, I think one of the people was going to ask, somebody was going to ask a question about this. And one of, I think, point number two that we've mm. all signed on to as a government, as a nation, is that we will be using sustainable utilization of wildlife. It is part of that mm. uh, thing that the government signed on to. Yeah. All right. um, I go with Keith Leggett's idea of uh, making wildlife valuable, and I go with Rosie's idea as well. There are, do, my question is, do you see a role for game parks? Because I can think of a couple of major firearm associations in Australia that are actually buying large tracts of land and returning it, or trying in their hardest to return it back to the, what it was before it was turned into cattle stations or wheat farms, etc., for hunting purposes. Now, we have a problem in that we're not allowed to hunt kangaroos in New South Wales as individuals. There is no licence for that at the moment. Do you see a place for these game parks? Because when you return it to its natural landscape, you increase and you get attraction of other animals in there, so the biodiversity will, will inc increase over time. I, I will throw the question back to you and say, how much are you prepared to hunt, to pay to hunt an individual animal in Australia? I've got friends who've actually gone over to America and paid $50,000. No, I mean, how much would you pay to hunt a kangaroo within Australia or well, a, a goat? Probably $100 just for the fun. Okay, this is what the base or price is. Now, it will then come back to the managers of the land, and if it, it's not economically viable. Absolutely fair, it's not. Yes, it has a significant role to play, but if you want to actually, as a conservation issue, it has to be an economically viable product. Elephant hunts $50,000. Rhino hunts, if you can get one, is $250,000 US to hunt a rhino. The, the old argument, is it viable to hunt these? Most of the un animals that are hunted are known and they're of an age group that don't reproduce anymore. All right, so the Australian situation is slightly different. Yes, I see a big role for hunting, but it, it's, it's, it's a it's toss up between a citizen hunt and a professional hunt. I'm, more, I'm very pro-professional hunting but I'm not terribly pro unlicensed, unregulated citizen hunting, which can affect the populations of animals in any way. I thoroughly agree with hunting, but it must be licensed, it must be regulated, and the number of quota offtake must be monitored by an external source, preferably governments. Um, I'd breed eastern quolls in New South Wales. I probably hold the most uh, quolls um, on mainland Australia, eastern quolls, and uh, I'd like to give everyone one in, in the room. <laughs> but <laughs> so what are these bizarre sexual habits that Mike alluded to? Uh, don't worry. <laughs> I know I do have to frisk Mike every time he visits the, <laughs> the quoll house at my place. But um, my question is the, to the panel is, um, is it more important to have the quolls as pets or as um, to save them conservation-wise? Like, I'd give everyone one here if they were back in the wild, um, back in their numbers the way they should have been. The eastern quoll is extinct on mainland Australia. It only survives in Tasmania. They're 
their numbers recently were estimated at 75% less of what they've, they've been in the past. So they're another species heading towards the brick wall. And uh, I've got an, uh, an objection to making them pets, obviously, because I want to save them first. And I believe they should be saved and back in their own environment as opposed to being bred as a pet and you know having a smooth skinned quoll or a, a rough skinned quoll or an interbred pink quoll, which is what happens when they turn into pets. So, so the question is? The question is, is, guys, is it more important to have them back in the wild as, uh, under conservation? Uh, uh, I, or I is it more to... important to have them as a pet and have them pink or purple or another I... colour that some breeder is going to breed them? Trevor, you and I have talked about this. And as far as I'm <laughs> concerned... <laughs> No, 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 no. We've agreed to agree that, that it's not either or. I think you're, the first thing, I agree totally with you. The first objective, if it's feasible, is to get them back into the environments where they were originally. Of course, the problem we know there is that those environments are not staying the same. And in some cases, like the Mountain Pygmy Possum Project we're working on, the environments are going to change so profoundly, and you're helping with this project as well, that we have to find alternative solutions to keeping whole lineages alive uh, because putting them back where they are now is not always going to work. But for the eastern quoll thing, yes it does. But I think we both agree that once that has been achieved, um, it's, there is a possibility of getting surplus individuals from the breeding colonies to start to be thought about as adjunct companions uh, once you know they're also safe in the wild. And wouldn't it be terrible if an adjunct companion actually escaped and established back in the wild? <laughs> no. The answer to that is no, that would not be terrible, <laughs> as opposed to having a feral cat, of course, which, which would be terrible. So I don't think we disagree, Trevor. I think I the first priority is to get them back in the environment and get the environment healthy again. Yeah, I think nobody would argue that in situ conservation is absolutely the first priority and the most important thing. But you know, all you'd need is for one very unfortunate bushfire up at Secret Creek, and that would be the Australian breeding colony of eastern quolls gone. How much better for these to be commercially valuable for only, say, limited number two, maybe three conservation-focused, experienced breeders to be able to breed them? We've already spread our bets, so we've got much, much less chance of any colony going extinct. You know, that's an incredibly vulnerable group that you've got there, one single population. Okay, we are running over time already, so I'd just quickly like to go through the, the, uh, the panel. Uh, starting with you, Greg, look, I know that we don't have crystal balls. We've heard new uh, ideas tonight for conservation, some suggestions of new directions. What in 10 years' time do you think might be taken up? What's realistic? What's likely to change? Um, being an optimist, as you've already heard tonight, <coughs> um, I think we're going to see dramatic ground change because as the public awareness grows that uh, wildlife in the bush is in trouble in Australia and they realise that they stand to lose so many things. I think the Australian public will demand radical change and we're developing alternatives and the alternatives will be there ready to start. Rosie? Okay, well, following that lead, I'm going to be optimistic and I'm going to see kangaroo not this kind of mass undifferentiated product. You know, at the moment, you don't even know what species you're buying when you go to the butcher and be specialist, high-end, very high-quality gourmet products with a return going to the farmer, with a, the clearly certified on the label that it's a, from um, an insti uh, a farm where wildlife is sustainably managed and you know exactly what species you, you're buying. So you might have female, Tibiburra, western grey kangaroo. Mike, I've never known you to be a, a <laughs> pessimist, so I assume you're going to be the third optimist here? Yeah, I'm absolutely optimistic um, because I think the size of the audience, um, the size of the uh, Australian populace that we know is interested in this, I'm, I'm basically with Greg on this. I think we are moving in the right direction. Uh, systems will flex up. They have to because we know what the alternatives are, and we always have to ask that question. Well, if we say we're not going to do some of these innovative things, well, what's the alternative? The alternative doesn't look too bright. So we've got to explore these things. And I, I see um, a rapid increase in interest in the Australian public in embracing all these things we're talking about. And not just in the animal zone, in the plant zone as well. How many people here have Wollamai pines in your backyard? See, look at that. That's a, a measure of the fact that we're, we're embracing the need to do these innovative things ourselves as individuals. And I think that's going to happen more and more. Yes, optimist. 
Keith? Optimist. If it can work in Africa, it can work here. <laughs> well, that's nice and short and sharp too, which is a great way to, to, br to bring the uh, discussion to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank our wonderful panel this evening. <laughs> Keith Leggett, Mike Archer, Rosie Cooney and Greg Miles. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.